What's good gamers? What's good? My name is Dr. Ryan Terrell, Psych Sensei here. Thought over the weekend it'd be really cool to cover some content, more specifically geared to League of Legends. So if you're a League player, this one's for you. Personal development moment, development moment. After like going through my own VODs, man, it was not fun watching myself. Some things I'm working on is saying um. I say um a button. Another thing that I realized, dude, I mumble so much. If you need me to enunciate, which I will be focusing on, please give me some emote that tells me that I'm slurring and enunciating and sounds like I'm really under the influence of something. So I'm going to be working on those two things for sure. Um, there's an um, jeez. If you haven't been here before, welcome. Uh, welcome to the experience. Welcome to the show. And what I like to do, I like to read articles. I like to model the Pomodoro technique, which is a very simple study technique. I recommend this to all of my students that I come in contact and even my players too. Basically all the Pomodoro is, is I set a timer. I read an article, talk through it, give some hot takes about what I'm thinking about and see how I can apply this to players or esports in general. After 20 minutes, you'll hear a ding. And at that ding, I like to take a break. I'll get up, I'll stretch, I'll drink some water. That's, I'm going to jump into this article. Again, I've catered most of these articles this week looking at league specific things. And the first article that I found is going to talk about stress and coping in esports that influence mental toughness. For all you people out there with issues in mental toughness, this one is for you. This article is entitled Stress and Coping in Esports and the Influence of Mental Toughness. Looks like it's Dylan Polois. I apologize if I butchered your name. And Tristan. J. Coulter coming out of Queensland University. Shout out to Australia. And this article was written in 2020. So they looked at influence and mental toughness by using the 4 slash 6 C and mental toughness index. They used 316 esport athletes that ranked in the top 40 of Defense Against Agents 2, League of Legends, Counter-Strike, Overwatch, and Rainbow Six Siege. So they took a couple of different questionnaires. They took the mental toughness questionnaire, the stress appraisal measure, and the brief cope inventory. They found mental toughness was associated with perceived control and stress intensity. Mental toughness was associated with the selection of more problem-focused and emotion-focused coping strategies and less avoidant coping strategy. They highlight that mental toughness and coping is similar in traditional and esports and suggest sports psychologist interventions would be cool. I think this is important. Problem-focused, emo-focused, better than avoidance. I think this also goes along with the things we were talking about last week with this intentional doing something versus avoiding it or catastrophizing. So this is also aligned with the other emotional regulation papers that we talked about. I think it's really funny that instead of talking about what benefits or what is happening in esports, people want to fight about the semantics of it. And is it a sport? Is it not a sport? If we get down to the degrees, I can see why it matters. But at the end of the day, like, does it matter? Is it defined as a sport or not? There's still things in here, but I guess let's just fight over nothing. I've got issues with avoidance. Takes a lot of effort to get myself to address things. It definitely is sometimes hard to face those things that you are afraid to face. What are you afraid of, man? What's the worst that could happen? If we really drill down to all these fears, it's going to be something like, I'ma die, but will you? I mean, social isolation also feels like death. At the same time, will you truly be alone? So it's really challenging those fears, I think. But at the same time, if the answer is really, yes, I'm gonna die if I do this, then don't do it. Professional suggestion. I totally would say this, that competitive and cooperative nature of esports requires similar mental skills as traditional sports. I'd argue even more so. I would argue more so because like text messaging, where you lose a sense of context, you lose that sense of communication versus being in person and actually talking or, or even face-to-face -face contact now with Rona. I think that's what makes it even more challenging. Sometimes there is the communication barrier of typing or even trying to communicate with your voice. At the same time, think of basketball or football or baseball or the physical touching that can go on that is communicative in nature. So there's communication lost in esports. I definitely think that the cooperative nature is much more tricky just because the typical roots of communication and camaraderie and teamwork are lost through remote. To achieve optimal performance, 11 mental skills were identified. For example, saying in the moment utilizing pre-performance routines and adapting to competition. Himmelstein et al. also identified four ways esport athletes acquired their skills. Setting goals, analyzing performance, practicing individual skills, and maintaining a growth mindset. Emotion focus, problem focus, avoidance approach, and appraising coping strategies were all employed. Esport athletes displayed faster response times and higher accuracy for simple choice reaction time. If I had to hypothesize the reason for this, they have a bigger mental model. This chunking of info experience goes in here 
here and I'd say lack of fatigue. When I say mental model and why I assume that the mental model would be bigger, okay, let's start from the beginning. What's a mental model? A mental model of a car would be your idea of a physical car in your head. Like the little small little car image idea of what that thing is in your head. That's a mental model. It's literally a mental representation of that idea. For example, if I was going to ask you, what is your mental model of an apple? Like when you think of an apple, what do you see? Most of you would say, okay, it's about this big. It's probably red. There may be a stem, maybe a leaf, maybe it's shiny. Usually it's a red delicious. That's what you're thinking of or a granny Smith something, but it's that general idea. If I asked you like, what does it taste like? You're probably going to say sweet unless you're being a smart ass and say, oh, it's sour like a granny Smith. What you think about it, how your experience is interacting with it. That's your mental model. And the way that your mental model grows is basically you interact with it or you have more experiences with it. So you begin to integrate ideas or if you've got something wrong, throw that idea out. As you continue to have more experiences with this thing, you become more accurate of having this thing in your head. Another way that you can quickly integrate information into your mental model would be through this thing called chunking. And what chunking is, is basically you have an experience with a thing or you learn about something in smaller blocks. And then after building smaller blocks, you become more efficient at getting information into these blocks. I guess the best example of chunking information would be studying in small little pieces. And then you build your knowledge off those small little pieces. So for example, if you're studying addition, you learn small little bits and pieces of addition at a time. Maybe you go through one plus ones. What's one plus one? What's two plus one? What's three plus one? And by the way, this is really old school because I know they teach math differently nowadays. And last time I saw how that taught math, it just didn't make any sense to me. So I'm going back to millennial math. Next time I will learn twos. So I'll learn two plus one, two plus two, two plus three. And maybe over the third day, I'll put it together. And so I, now I have one and two. So then next day, I'm going to chunk that information and go into the next set. And so once I keep building these blocks up over time, I'm going to have this full set or at least understand the concept of addition. The more that I do this, the more efficient I will become in encoding information. So the chunks become bigger because I can actually understand bigger and bigger chunks of information because I have a solid foundation that's chunky. Now, the reason why I think chunking and mental models go together is because as soon as you get more efficient in understanding the game, understand the elements of the game, understanding the champions or whatever, you begin to learn more quickly and you don't need to understand everything step by step because you can chunk information and thus increasing your mental model. Why is it important to do like have a bigger mental model is because all of this chunking, processing information, gathering of information, this all takes cognitive energy. Something you have to think about too is that you are a cognitive miser. And what does that mean? The TLDR is the dude, your brain is super lazy. It wants to conserve energy because using this is really tiring. So because your brain is super lazy, it already tries to make shortcuts. So it doesn't have to work overtime. The problem with that is if you don't think or you don't actually encode all the information, it's gone. When you go through this chunking process, it's very, very slow. And after you begin chunking it, your brain becomes more efficient and can do it faster. That's why it's really frustrating. And we've heard about that term called the learning curve. And that's what we're talking about here. How can you learn and critically think and get all this information in there so you can build this mental model and continue to build information on it. So that's why I'm saying chunking of information, experience helps that, and all of those things decrease fatigue because you don't need to use energy to continue to build upon your mental model or to expand it. That's why eSport athletes at an elite level are able to have faster response times because if you're thinking about speed, what you're talking about is execution. It's the lack of thinking because if you have to think about something, you slow down. But if it's already automated, because you've chunked it in there and you have a mental model of what you're supposed to do, then it's up to these babies to execute. A factor that has been shown to influence performance in sport is the way athletes cope with stressors they encounter. Yup. And if I know anything about esports, it's all about this baby. The meta game to esports is who can keep their frontal lobes online for longer. That's really the sub game. An athlete's ability to cope with stress has been shown to be important to success in traditional sport. How many have heard that question of what percentage do you think this game is mental and physical? That's like the common question sports psychologists ask or all coaches ask is how much do you think this game is physical versus mental? And if you get baited, which you always do, you say, oh, you at least say it's 50-50. It has to be at least 50-50, right? Like, 50 mental, 50 physical. But if you want to get baited into the question, which you probably will, you'll say, oh, it's like 80% mental, like 20% physical. And then the follow-up question to that is always, well, how much time do you spend on your mental versus your physical? If you say mental is 80% versus 20%, you just see everyone's heads get blown or they get like, oh, I got baited. I noticed something. It may sound weird, but I noticed a really big jump in the speed of improvement in a game, Osu, while I was doing physical exercises. It's all connected. Mind-body is all 
all connected. So if you're doing exercises, I mean, that's the basis of the pyramid for sure. Like if you're not eating, sleeping, drinking water, if you don't have that base period, there's no way you can think. There's no way you can do this well. That makes sense to me when you exercise and it's a time limits and boundaries. That's just another thing you're doing to take care of yourself. Makes total sense. Mind and body is connected. Going back to traditional sports and esports. If then 50% at least is there for traditional sports and you're supposed to spend at least 50% or it's a big factor or a factor, it's acknowledged. If that's true, why wouldn't mental and cognitive techniques or regulation or stress interpretation not be important in esports when esports is all about mental cognition? Because you're not using your gross body skills to tackle somebody or dunk a ball or hit a ball or dance or something. What you're doing is using fine motor skills. Don't get me wrong. Now, I'm not saying that mechanics don't matter because they totally matter. Can you click heads? Can you execute this combo? Can you 1v9 when given the opportunity? All of these things are definitely a part of it. However, if you're unable to think, if you're unable to access frontal lobe, your chances of actually executing that in real time or feeling confident that you can do it or seeing opportunities, they go down drastically. Not saying that you can't do it because you still can. But what I'm saying is that the opportunity and the chance for you to actually execute those things and be confident and see them is greatly decreased. We were talking about exercising. Are you doing the basics? That's what it really comes down to. Are you doing the basics to take care of yourself? Are you eating? Are you sleeping? Are you exercising? Do you have food and shelter and water? Like those are like the basics, basics. Because let's put it this way. Say you have all those things, but you're not sleeping. How are you supposed to think? How slow is your brain working and moving? Very slow. If you don't eat, how's your mood? It's bad, probably. Or are you thinking about eating? And if you're thinking about anything else but the game in game, you're distracted. So these are the fundamental things that we need to take care of. Then we can start addressing your tilt because we can only start addressing tilts and structuring your training and setting objective measures after all those fundamental things are taken care of. Because if the fundamentals aren't there, then it's, it's a wrap. I mean, that also applies to your game. For example, in League of Legends, if you can't control the camera or you have zero control over your champion or knowing your champion's limits or even how that champion works and operates, you're not gonna have a good time. Or even Rainbow Six, if you're playing this operator and you don't know the strengths and weaknesses of this operator, if you don't know the map, if you don't know the callouts to the map, you're not gonna have a good time either. If you don't know how to use your util or your drones and you can't see anything, you're not gonna have a good time because you don't know where they are unless you're just gonna play for gunplay. But even gunplay, there's basics. There's aiming. If you can't aim, it's a wrap. If you don't know what gun to use and when to use that gun, that's a wrap too. So we're going back down to basics and fundamentals. Everybody wants to do the crazy stuff up here, the crazy cheesy strats. Everyone wants to have crazy, crazy drafts or crazy, crazy team comps. At the same time, the question then becomes, can you execute it? Sure, you know how it works and how it should go and this and that, but can you actually execute it? That's the question. Uh, what you said about the brain is so true. The laziness. I really like League of Legends, but I haven't been able to be consistent, mainly because I think a lot while I play in a normal game compared to an ARAM. How's this, man? Like, what are you playing for? You can play ARAM, that's fine. It's a fun game. At the same time, what you could use ARAM for, learn champions, learn their limits. It's a different game for sure. It's not League of Legends per se. But at the same time, if you used ARAM for a different purpose and you got something out of it, that's the bell. If you get something out of it, like I'm going to play ARAM because I've never played Mordekaiser before and I want to see how this champion works. ARAM is the perfect place to try it because there's no ramifications if you junk. If you die a lot, you're supposed to. It's a fun game mode that means nothing and you get something from the mode. There could be steps to it. And then when you go play a normie game, you could go play that normie game with the idea of oh I want to now work on CS with this champion and then you can progressively move up from the norming game to a regular draft game and then then take it into ranked I mean you could step ladder that too what this goes back down to is that you are building your mental model and once you start integrating that champion into your mental model or how X lane should be played or X champion should be made the transition is gonna be smoothest because you've chunked that info See, boys and girls, I try to bring it all the way back around for you. I learned so many champs like Garen, Mord, and ADC. The thing is that I find myself only playing ARAMs over and over because normal games are scary. Mistakes in lane can be really hard to cover. If that's your fear, normies is the perfect place to make them. The training then becomes not playing the champion, but now we're focusing on stress and emotional regulation for you in the game. So the purpose of why you're playing that game now changes. It's no longer focused on the champion, it's focused on you and what you're experiencing experiencing and can you manage that emotion and come back from playing a mistake or acknowledging that you made a mistake and now it's your job to bounce back and adapt. Maybe that's what you're working on now, not the champion. It sounds like this is coming offline when you make a mistake. Oh no, I'm focused on that mistake. I'm ruminating. I'm catastrophizing instead of what they suggested, which was problem focused and emotional focused control or moving forward. That's what I'm thinking. Try that out. One of my favorite quotes come from Jake from Adventure Time. Sensei Jake says, the first step to getting good at something is sucking at it. That's true. You got to suck at something to get good. So many gems already. So many gems. They use a 
Cognitive Motivational Relational Theory of Stress and Coping. Cognitive Motivational Relational Theory is the frame of appraisals of stressors, coping, and the consequences are viewed as a dynamic, recursive process between the individual and his or her environment. These are the things I want to highlight. Appraisals. Voluntary. Why am I highlighting these words? I'm highlighting these three words, or two words, I guess appraising is the same word, just with an ing at the end. Appraisal and voluntary. Why am I highlighting these two words? Simple. Appraisal comes to your perception. That's you. Appraisal is how you are perceiving an event to be versus how an event actually is. I'm highlighting this is because I want to make the point of it's all relative and your perception dictates reality. Your perception dictates how you interpret that event as a good or bad, how intense that thing is and what it means to you. So check yourself because it comes down to perception. The next thing I want to talk about is voluntary. What this means to me, this word is that you, you have a choice and a more you powered center word instead of choice would be intention. Not only do you have a choice in how you act and behave, you also get to be intentional in that. But you can only be intentional if you have awareness. This is it right here, boys and girls. These two things, perception and choice and power. This is it. You get to choose how you want to respond. You have so much power, never give your power up. So they identified three common higher order dimensions of coping responses. PFC, strategies aimed at changing stressful situations. EFC, strategies to regulate emotions associated with stressful situation. And AC, physical or cognitive efforts to disengage from the stressor. Emotion focused, problem focused, and avoidance focused. Studies have indicated that stable personality factors can directly or indirectly influence the stress coping process. Two leading perspectives of mental toughness in traditional sports or sports psychology. One's based on the concept of hardiness, a stress buffering personality trait. Three factors, hardness construct, challenge commitment to one's goals and control emotions in life. And from this, they developed a 48 item mental toughness questionnaire too, I guess. The second method derives from qualitative methods to understand people's perceptions of MT and its core attributes. That is what the mental toughness index is based on and assesses seven core constructs, general self-efficacy, buoyancy, success mindset, optimistic style, content knowledge, emotion regulation, and attention regulation. We go back to the OG fight here between biology and environment. The study aims to incorporate both perspectives into its research design. I'm glad that they're doing this because it's both. It's not one or the other. It is definitely a piece of your biology that makes up your personality, but at the same time, there are outside factors that influence you or things that you can do to grow your inherent or innate talents, it is definitely both. It's not one or the other. To think it's one or the other purely would be a mistake. A study found that higher levels of mental toughness were associated with lower levels of perceived stress and higher levels of emotional control. But what I think they're saying is that in the context of mental toughness, avoidance strategies are not that effective. It was also found that in athletes, again, perception of challenge and threat was associated with one's perceived control of the stressor. You know what this reminds me of what we're talking about? Cognitive reframes. Because again, we're talking about perception, the perception of challenge. The direct application of this is if you say, oh, this thing is very hard versus saying, oh, this thing is really challenging. Oh, I failed versus, oh, this is an opportunity for me to grow. All of these are cognitive reframes that talk about changing your perception of challenge, which leads to better mental toughness. Here's the thing too, all this stuff doesn't just apply to sports. If you think about this as a test, same thing. Even like asking someone on date, same thing. Higher levels of control were associated with perceiving the stressor as a challenge and lower levels of control were associated with perceiving the stressor as a threat. Putting this together with the statements above with mental models and things like that, that's essentially what you're doing too is once you create the mental model as seeing stress as challenges that now becomes the new mode of operation that you work from versus seeing your mental model being threat and stress as bad and death if that's how you're working it that's the mental model that you're working with so sometimes it's literally taking that mental model and chucking it out of your head and building a new mental model hmm i wonder if locus of control literature will be applicable to this yes locus of control we're talking about anything controlly a circle of influence and circle of control that's something i use with my players 
players too. All this comes about to control, or at least I'd like to place it into control because oftentimes when you think about why teams fight, they're talking about blame, they're talking about tilt, they're talking about the game state. All of these things, they're giving up control to the randomness of the game versus, okay, where are your points of control and what could you have done to regain control of this game or regain control of yourself? Because also if you focus on those randomnesses, it's really hard to replicate moving forward. If you focused on something that's not in your control, you can't replicate it in the future to continue your success. So always trying to bridge back what they're doing to their control so they can replicate it. That's the key. It's really crazy that they looked at this many games. I think it's really impressive that they looked at one, two, three, four, five, six games. And looking at the top 40, there probably isn't that many in the top 40, but even just to look at all these games, I really wish they stuck to a genre or compared mobile games to tech shooters. But I think even looking at the types of players and the types of things that you need to do in each of these games, these two categories of games, I think are really different. The present studies examine stress and coping in competitive esports and explore how this regulatory process may be influenced by mental toughness. It is predicted that esport athletes with higher mental toughness scores will report lower levels of stress intensity and higher levels of perceived control. See stressors more as a challenge than a threat and use more problem focused and less emotion focused and avoidance focused stuff. They also hypothesized that esports athletes who scored higher in MT will have higher levels of achievement determined by in-game rank. Finally, the potential similarities or differences across the two mental toughness conceptualizations were explored. The only junk thing, especially in a team game, is that achievement in a team game is so team dependent. It's really difficult to say that if they're better at this, they're gonna have higher levels of this because of the in-game rank. I understand why they're taking this measurement as saying that if they have better mental toughness, this should be higher achieving on the rank system. Makes sense. However, I think what they are going to need to acknowledge later on is that team games and how you rank in a team game is not solely dependent on your individual play. Not like chess or team fight tactics, like a 1v1 fighting game. So I think that's where I really want to leave it for today. So far, I think this is a really interesting study. I really do like how they looked at traditional sports and tried to apply what they know about traditional sports and they try to put it into esports. I do think that there are are some challenges with that for sure. At the same time, I do really want to reinforce my belief of how much of a cognitive game esports is and how much thinking it involves rather than traditional sports. Gotta say, I like the 20 minute intervals. Sometimes I get mush brain when I sit with an article for too long. This is exactly why I want to model the Pomodoro technique. This is a literal shout out to all my students and all of you people who need to read articles. I definitely remember what it was like to read articles and books. I think I would have the same approach to reading as I do with games or did with games where I was like, oh, I can just sit down and pound this article out. Or I have like X number of chapters, I'm just gonna sit down and just go for it. And same things you would do in games where I have an eight hour gaming session and I feel like it's going to be a productive one. With reading, you can get brain mush while playing and it just looks differently. It feels the same, your brain feels mushy. It just looks different. And in gaming, last week we found out that accuracy goes down, but speed still remains with your thinking after prolonged gameplay. If you are going the same speed, the mouse is clicking the same rate, but the accuracy of your thoughts are going down and the quality of your thoughts are going down, guess what? It's time for you to take a break. I think a league game, a long one is like two of these. So if you multiply that two Pomodoros in a row with no breaks, and then you play five games in a row, that's what? 40 times five? Oh God, math. 200 minutes? Is that correct? It's like 200 minutes straight of really cognitively intense calculations. And then you're supposed to do that well. It doesn't make any sense. It really does not. Thank you again for tuning in. And I like to leave positive notes. This one is don't give up your power. And your power can extend to how you use your brain and how you see things. That's all in your power. Yes, it can be challenging and it can be difficult. But I assure you, as soon as we start working on that mental model and changing how you perceive it, it's gonna be a lot more smooth. If you're afraid of playing champs and making mistakes, you can ask yourself, did I die? Literally, I'd be like IRL. And the answer is no, you didn't. And you didn't die. You live another day and you can learn more. Keep learning. And as always, my name is Dr. Ryan Terrell, teaching you how to think, play, and slay one article, one day, one game at a time. All right, gangies, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Same time, same place. Shoots.